So today we were told that uh, our theme is listen, learn, and mobilize. So I'm really excited to uh, be able to start this dialogue and have this conversation with you all. Um, so I'm going to begin, I think, by telling you a little bit about who I am and sharing with you something that is on my heart and on my mind this morning. So my name is Kaya Morris, as you may have seen from the bio, and I serve in the legislature in the House of Representatives here for the state of Vermont. I come all the way from Bennington, Vermont, so if I get a little tired, it's just because I only had one cup of coffee and I started driving at 5 a.m. <laughs> so, <laughs> but this is important. It's all love, it's all love. No complaints on that. So what I um, wanted to share with you is a, I feel it's central to the discussion we're gonna have today about what activism looks and feels like in our everyday lives and how we can transform that into advocacy to get actual policy done that also impacts our lives. I am a wife and a mother of a young son. My son Jamal is six years old. And as it is throughout the nation, as it is throughout our country's history, the movement of women, the movement of black women into places of power, of influence, of leadership, be it as a business owner, be it as a teacher, be it from a number of different roles, is always fraught with oppression and is always met with resistance, violence, and threats to your life, to your spirit, to your heart. We know this to be true. I don't have to give you statistics on that. It's something we've felt and seen in our lives in many different ways. So last year, actually we can go back a little bit further. When I first ran for office, I decided to just take that step. I'd already been working very diligently in the community. I came to know a number of people from the court systems to the schools to our healthcare system and had been really encouraged to consider taking the next step of becoming an actual titled leader, so to speak. <laughs> And I remember I had a campaign event. We decided to make it a block party type of thing. And I did it on the corner of a street that this particular block and a half is maligned in our community as one of those horrible places where all crime and all the drugs are. Not surprisingly where all the people of color live and where poverty is high. And one of the things that people don't know about that neighborhood is it's actually more of a neighborhood than most places in Bennington, Vermont, where the neighbors actually know one another and they're out on the streets looking out for each other's kids. You know, like how it used to be before you had five people on your street and didn't know who any of them were. But I decided to have this party. I had a live band, free music, we had childcare, we had kids' activities, all sorts of things. And this gentleman came to the event and actually came up to my husband and was like, I had to come today. I had to come. And he said, why? He's like, because your wife left one of her brochures on the dresser, I mean, on um, the door outside of my house. And one of my neighbors came over and brought that brochure and said, can you believe the audacity of this nigger to think she could run for office? And he said, I had to be there. <laughs> he said, I must come and I must show support. Good. So this is where this began. And this underbelly, this theme of racism has never left, and it came to a glaring head for my family last year with actions from a, a not only hateful person, full of self-hate, but from his supporters, from his compatriots in their mode of white supremacy, a gentleman by the name of Max Misch, whose grandmother survived the Holocaust, to say the least and had become a die-hard neo-Nazi combat veteran, bodybuilder who does a lot of steroids and reads a lot of 4chan and places like that. So he'd had a great opportunity to build up on all of his masculine pride and violence against his own wife where he tried to murder her and decided to turn the target on me and my family. 
So I'm sharing this story with you because last week, we couldn't figure out what was wrong in our home. We could not figure out why we were so distressed, why we were arguing with each other, why we were feeling like we were talking to one another but not hearing each other, why we couldn't sleep, why we couldn't eat, and came to realize that it was the anniversary of the day that three men broke into our home at three in the morning with full intentions to harm us. Law enforcement was under no illusions that they came to steal actual items of value because they left those behind and instead took items that would be able to use to restrain us and to terrorize us. If not for our dog, who on that same night last week also awoke from a dream about that night barking and stressed out. So these are the things that happen to us on a daily basis. These are the things that we don't heal ourselves from. These are the things that come inside of our soul and they try to come out of our voice, but sometimes our throat is just caught. And it is that pain and it is that anger, it is that frustration of seeing these injustices happen that drive us towards activism. It is an act of saying, you're going to hear me. You will fully understand my story because someone is not listening to my pain, to the pain of my people, to the pain of my community, and to the very real things that are happening every day. Someone is not listening and they need to be made aware. That is at the heart of activism. So now that I've done that, I could feel the whole room going, oh dear God, what do we do with this? <laughs> so I'd like to ask you all to take a moment, close your eyes, and take a few deep breaths so we can start to release this a little bit. Just breathe in some tranquility. Know that you are in a safe space. Know that your pain is validated. Your pleasure is not ignored. Your fears are real. And your passion is mighty. Own that. So when we talk about activism, let's take a quick second to talk about some activist <coughs> movements that have meaning for you. It don't have to be last week. It could be from the start of this country. It could be from another country even. And I just want to get a chance to name some of these different movements so we can kind of recall a little bit of that power and that energy that's going into trying to shape our world. Um, suffragist. Suffragist movement? Yeah. Any others? Anti-nuke. Abolition. Voter registration. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to get them all down. Don't worry if we don't. Environmental. Mm -hmm. Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. NAACP. Criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. Arab Spring. Yeah. <laughs> Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. Civil rights. I'm sorry, I heard something about your. The Alliance for the Mentally Ill. Yeah. Alliance for the Mentally Ill. Marriage equality. The MAD movement. Mm -hmm. MAD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the anti gun. Mm -hmm. Antifa? The Antifa? The anti fascist. Mm -hmm. Any other? Labor movement. Mm -hmm. Any particular acts within these movements that you want to call out? Selma. Selma? March on Washington. March on Washington. Mm -hmm. Which one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, which one? Yes, which one? Several. I need a new paper. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. We're going to fill this okay. up and then we're going to keep carrying on. Any others? LGBTQ movement. Yes. Mm -hmm. Stonewall. 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 Mm -hmm. Healthcare justice. <laughs> Earth first. Earth first? Okay. I heard lunch, lunch counter. The lunch counters. Mm -hmm. Standing rocks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah.
couple more. It's not here in this country, but Kenya, I need to be planting tree movement. It's hard to hear you over here. Oh, the planting tree movement in Kenya. Thank you. I'm on here in the side. Act up. Mm -hmm. Reproductive rights. Can I put reproductive justice? Yes. Sure. So this is, we're just scratching the surface, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've gone back a couple hundred years. We could go back and show you, right? These are all movements that began from a concept, that began from a voice, that began that came from a person, a person, a community, people who said, we have to shift something. We have to shift it fundamentally. Within these movements were lots of little actions that took place, some large, some small, and many people played many different roles in order to be able to make that happen. So where has this activism brought us? see if we can uh, come up with some laws that have helped us advance the cause of social justice. Doesn't mean that we've arrived at social justice. Not saying that at all. But that got us started towards finding human and civil rights for all. ADA. Voting Rights Act. DACA. Sorry? DACA. DACA. Right to marry. Right to marry. 19th Amendment. Anything else? Yeah. Clean Water, Clean Air Act. <laughs> Even though it wasn't ratified, the ERA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> Any other? National Labor Laws. Violence Against Women Act. Brigham decision really right to education. Them. Restorative justice to be used in criminal justice and education. Mm -hmm. Law and then the commissioner's uh, judgment outlawing uh, insurance company discrimination against transgender individuals. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Fair and impartial policing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Fifty, because yeah. it mm -hmm. you know has prevented a lot of environmental racism, etc. Thank you. You're all done with this crime. I have done okay. with this crime. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It is really difficult to capture all that. Huh? <laughs> Thank you very much for doing that. So let's talk a little bit about what activism is. And so when we think about activism, we think about the activist movements that happen. Again, they were both very large scale organized, um, organized movements that had many different pieces to them, many different approaches to try to get their message across, as well as smaller bits that different people picked up at different points in time. Activism, what it does, again, is it forces a conversation that may not take place, if not but for mm. that activism. So when we talk about activism, we think of protests and demonstrations, we think about letter writing campaigns, hunger strikes, sit-ins, acts of civil disobedience, protest art, petitions, boycotts. And really, they're centralized on a concept of amplifying a voice and a story. Activism is striking, it requires, it demands an urgent response. 
Activism demands audience without invitation. Activism shows the magnitude of people power behind a vision, a voice, behind the work. It demands a seat at the decision-making table, and it can be quickly implemented. So one of an activist movement that happened in Chicago, which is where I come from originally, that was really, really powerful at a time when Chicago's <laughs> violence, much like it is right now, was at the highest of its peak. And people said, no more, we need to get our kids, we're tired of seeing our children in body bags. And so we saw the black and Latino communities coming together. And during this time, a Latino community called Little Village on the north side of Chicago said, we need a school of our own that our kids can go to that's safe, that's clean, that has all the things that are promised to us, right, through our educational laws and equal access to education. And so they were promised funding to build the Little Village High School. That money was taken away and instead used to build the most state-of-the-art expensive school in Chicago's history. Needless to say, it's almost predominantly white. Right? So these mothers said, <laughs> these are our children, this is not a game. And they went on a hunger strike for over a month. Mm -hmm. They said, we're going to place our bodies on the line to save our children's lives. And you're going to hear us. And you're gonna understand, and our death is gonna be on your hands if you don't take action. And so only through doing this violence to their own bodies were they able to get the funding that they needed. And now it's a fantastic school built on a social justice model. But these women had to say from their vantage, as a woman, as a mother, I have a responsibility to do what I can to fight what is happening and the injustices that are occurring right in front of us. That we can't be passive in letting these things happen to us. Not everyone can do that. <coughs> I don't want to say that that has to happen, but that activism led to a distinct policy change. So while there still is a system of oppression in Chicago that's pretty hefty, they were able to reverse it fairly quickly with a new mayor and new administration and bringing in a CEO of schools instead of having a superintendent. It didn't take very long for them to flip it back to where they wanted it to be. But it still gave a venue and a mechanism for people to say, we can't stand for this. So advocacy is a little bit different than activism. And I bring this up because it's important. It's going to really help shape some of our conversation today. So when we think of advocacy at its very baseline, lobbying. There are good lobbyists. There are plenty of good lobbyists in this room. In this building. <laughs> Not every lobbyist works for pharma. <laughs> Not every lobbyist works for big tobacco. There are many that are out there fighting for causes that are dear to your heart. It includes education of lawmakers because, you know, we're all people and not everyone is an expert on everything. And so as a lawmaker, you kind of need to understand the nuances sometimes of the laws that you're passing because you probably didn't even write them yourself. So understanding what that means and what it would look like when you implement it. It's around building awareness campaigns. We talked about the Mothers Against Drunk Driving. That was a group that came up and much of their movement was built around building awareness, right? That's why we know their name in that particular fashion. <coughs> Media outreach, policy recommendations, and it's usually it kind of results in a task force or working group of some sort. It's driven through the voice often of an individual or someone representing an organization. So versus people on the street coming forth in large numbers as a show of force, it's one individual sitting across the table sometimes from that decision maker, from that policy maker, on that task force to get that work done. It may actually be the result of activist action people coming together and saying, you don't get to sell off our water, that's not happening, you need to change the law that there can't be municipalities that do that kind of thing, right? It's long term, it's a long term. The machine, the bureaucracy is a big hefty one and it moves mighty slow. It's a long term end game, but it's systems oriented. How do we change the system to make the laws work and be effective? And it works towards the answer of, I heard you. You are absolutely right. 
The number of black kids going to Woodside is ridiculous. It is repugnant. So now what? It asks the question, so now what? We try to come up with an answer to that. And it drives the implementation to ensure that the work actually gets done. Advocacy works with a champion, usually within the system. So it could be a legislator, it could be an administrator, it could be somebody within the system that's gonna fight to try to make sure that that law gets passed or to make sure that somebody's held accountable <coughs> inside has to come back, give us a report, say whether or not we're pleased with the work that got done. Once we gave you your charge, did you actually do it? So you usually have someone, or it could be multiple individuals who are the champions for that work. And they generally hold a seat at the table. And again, that's not meant to be a point of privilege, <coughs> but it's to say that's the individual who may have a particular set of skills that's really good at negotiating, really good at being able to understand this completely confusing, intentionally so, behemoth of a system that we have that is affecting our everyday lives in multiple ways. So, when I think about that, I think about the term political courage. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about political courage, I'm gonna give you a definition, and then I'd like to hear from you as to how you think these three concepts come together. So political courage is the ability to push forth policy that's responsive to the people's needs regardless of consequence. And I first heard about the idea of political courage long before I thought about running from office from a young woman named Amara Enya who decided to run for mayor of the city of Chicago. She's the daughter of immigrants. She was only like 35 at the time. PhD in uh, educational policy and urban planning and saw what was happening, the disparate things that were happening throughout the city, and said, I want to run for office. And went grassroots, not door to door. She's like, I'm a progressive candidate, and I'm doing it. She worked her butt off for two years. And I want to tell you about the sad story of how the machine shut her down. But here's the thing that she made people ask, because she was going up against Rahm Emanuel, who was an established, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. well-protected mayor who was ushered in through President Obama's administration and did some pretty horrible things yeah. to the city during his term. And she wanted to go up against the machine. She said, you know what? That's where you need to start answering the question. Do you have the political courage to actually do what you said you were going to do? Do you truly believe that education is a right for all children? Because if you do, then why are you shutting down the schools? Why are you laying off your teachers? Why is this? Why are we seeing these disparities? If you believe that police brutality is wrong, then why are you putting people on your commission who have histories of police brutality? Why are you doing these very things that are counter to making a thriving community and to caring about the voices of the people? So political courage also is about the ability to drive agendas that may not be popular but are absolutely necessary. You get voted into office, you can get voted out, but you know what? You have a job to do while you're there. You have a job to do while you're there. And you hope that you'll be able to hold your seat, but go down swinging. As women, and especially as women of color, this courage must work towards the eradication of issues around race, gender, class, and civil rights violations. That courage has to be centered on true social justice. So how does activism <coughs> help build political courage? amongst decision makers. We have 13 minutes. <laughs> no way. Yeah, 13 what? minutes. What? <laughs> it's been like two hours in the last one. That's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the last one was over. I wish this one was over. <laughs> it did go over. That wasn't fair. So I'm sorry. How does political activism feed into political courage? As an individual, like your example of the women who went on hunger strike, you're putting yourself, your body, and maybe your family um, at risk for some consequence. Um, and that builds experience um, and courage. Yeah, and will willingness to do the next thing. Willingness to do the next thing. To um, organize, pull more people together. Mm -hmm. um, activists experience many fewer successes than wins, but that those successes, um, including the success of um, feeling the collective power, 
um, grow are enough to keep people moving to change policy, to change, to stop a situation, to mm -hmm. um, change a community. Mm -hmm. So Mari has been a part of a team um, through Rights and Democracy that's been going to D.C. to protest against the health care bill. She's put herself on the line several times. Mm -hmm. um, as a leader of Rights and Democracy. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is because one of the things that I had the opportunity to see when I was down there was that political courage was lacking in many places. You had individuals from the disability community that were literally sleeping. They're sleeping outside in the rain, outside of the Senate offices just wanting an audience with their legislators and were unable to get to that because they refused to even hear them. Not even saying you gotta agree. Hear them. There takes a certain level of political courage to have your way of thinking challenged directly by looking into the face of that parent with that kid in a wheelchair and saying, I, I promise you it won't hurt if we do this policy when you know that it's not true. It is harder to hold that accountable. So that political courage is something that's needed in order to truly even be an activist-centered legislator, to be an activist-centered administrator. So something that I do want to come to, I think is really important as we think about this, is the concept of call-out culture. Can anyone tell me what call-out culture is? It's a few, like, bring it up if somebody says something racist or somebody says something misogynist it's the I mean I think in a neutral sense it would be just that you say are you aware right you're bringing it up but I think it has a negative connotation right that of that we're always tearing each other down if we don't have a perfect understanding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so when is calling out important I appreciate that thank you when is calling out important <laughs> uh, and the person being called out is the person in a position of power, mm. as opposed to someone you're trying to bring in and call in. Um, you may have to publicly shame someone to get them to do the right thing if they're holding power. Mm. Okay. Come back to that. Any other thoughts? When someone's being harmed, mm -hmm. in danger in some way, physically, spiritually, emotionally. Um, when you're in a group of white folks that are being racist. <laughs> I'd say any time when you hold privilege in a situation, mm -hmm. it's your responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you repeat that? that? Any time when you hold a privilege in a situation, it becomes your responsibility to speak up. I like fact checking. It is. So one of the things that I want to challenge you on is the intersection between activism political courage and advocacy when it relates to call-out culture. Anyone can tell you, if you go to our white state website, it's almost impossible to navigate, to figure out where anything is, understand how these processes work. It's a crash course when you get in there and you're in the office to even understand where you drop off pieces of paper or what you have to sign or don't sign and <laughs> who you talk to about even where your little cubby is. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Government is by design a really big, huge, complicated, overly complicated machine. And part of the challenge that happens within call-out culture is that sometimes, especially when we talk about our political champions, our administrative champions that may be within these places, is that our activism, our real pain, causes us to call out people at times when it's, mm. it's not helpful. Mm. So I will share a story briefly um, of something that I saw that was really unfortunate, I think, this year, that happened in our legislature. We had um, money that was set aside in the budget. It was, it was specifically line item to be able to do water cleanup for Lake Champlain. Now within this, understand that there's already, I come from Bennington, so we pretty much feel like we don't exist. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna just fade into New York or Massachusetts and pretty much let the state <laughs> give a crap about what happened to us, right? <laughs> so we're one community of many that are outside the Chittenden County bubble. Right. And Chittenden County gets a bad rap for that as well, <laughs> feeling like, hey, you know, don't be mad at us, I'm sorry. <laughs> we're trying to get things done. Well, so Lake Champlain cleanup was really important for a lot of people and thinking about our environmental issues and the issues of environmental justice, right? Mm -hmm. Which is actually intersectional. It's got race, it's got class, it's got gender built into how we make our waterways clean and what that means for our communities, right? 
So we had this money set aside, and within an austere budget where we weren't even going to be able to get anything passed, there were some reductions in this dedicated line item, which most communities don't have at all. There are no dedicated line items for cleanup and water in Bennington. We actually had to sue our polluters in order to get money for remediation. And an activist railed against others where that money got reallocated to help support housing. Because you know, we have an affordable housing crisis here in our state. We have a homeless issue here in our state. And these were important issues. And it was ugly. And it was horrible saying, well, you should have fought. Well, maybe instead of calling out, that, calling out our other allies and calling them sellouts for taking that money to be able to make sure people aren't homeless, that we think a little bit differently about how that flows. Within the work that happened with the racial justice panel, there were so many fits and starts between the messages that were being put out in the community and the activist community and what was actually happening in the building to the point where it almost killed the bill twice. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't because of resistance within the building, but it was because of people being called out that should not have been called out. Mm -hmm. And again, coming from a place of real pain that is absolutely valid, but was causing a reactionism that was turning people away and say, making people say, we don't want this fight to go on. We, we got other things to think about right now. But we pressed on, didn't we? And we got it signed. And we almost didn't get it signed in the way we wanted. Mm -hmm. There's so many things like that that happen that are difficult because you say, I wanted this full amount and I didn't get everything I wanted. And we need the extremes on sometimes of people to say, don't compromise, but understanding that in order to get some things done, it's going to look and feel very different. So that is all to say, please don't stop protesting. <laughs> please don't stop letter writing. Please don't stop calling. That is not what we need to do. It's not about silencing voices, but it is about understanding that there are different roles that we can each play within this movement to make things better. And there are people who are very good at making signs for protests. <laughs> there are people that are very good at organizing people. There are people that are very good at writing letters to the editor. There are people that are good at so many different places and come from a good place and need to be able to get their work done. And we have to all work together on this. So take your concerns as you see them happening. Work with agencies and organizations that you believe in and trust on some levels, which it has to be earned. We get that. But trust that it is, a, it is a shift that we have to make in order to get things done. Because if we're fighting amongst each other, mm -hmm. that's, when, that's when they win. Because mm -hmm. we're distracted. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Questions? Five minutes. Not questions. Perfect. <laughs> questions. Questions, comments, thoughts? I think just a point of clarification as someone who worked in state government for 30 years and like can totally identify what you need to be strategic when you want that big thing to move. Um, and in the workshop that I attended first, hearing from Ebony that when she has something to say and she's angry about it, um, we need to listen and, and accept and embrace her anger. And <clears throat> so it kind of sounds like you're saying don't do what Ebony was saying when you're in the political arena, but could you just speak to like the two, how those two come together? I want to make sure that I'm understanding your question correctly. So essentially, it's a, you were saying that in the previous workshop, the message was delivered to say, I have this place of pain, I have this anger, and I want you to hear it and acknowledge it and, and speak to that. Right, and she said it in the context of other people criticizing her for the way she right. talks mm. about her pain or something. And so I'm imagining someone having that same pain wanting to come and testify mm -hmm. in front of the legislature. Mm -hmm. hmm. Those feel like almost two different things. Yeah. So, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Ebony was talking about telling her story and her truth, which is a very different anger than calling out another person for what they've done and attacking other people. And I just mm -hmm. think. They were very different things, yeah. and you need to be able, when you're telling your story, you've got to be able to tell it your way, and that's different than attacking other people. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, can, I just know that there are times when people are attacking others and telling their story, mm -hmm. and it plays itself out that way a lot in it the does. House. Yeah. It does, it absolutely does. Um, and some of that, 
some of the pain and the fear that comes through on that and that moments it's it's not invalid mm -hmm. um, but it may not be accurate mm -hmm. it may be Wait, speaking about something that's positioned differently and this is hard because I'm trying to tell these stories but I don't want to tell other people's stories mm -hmm. as right, I can right, speak to right. legislators that are like we're in tears over the bathroom bill going why am I being attacked I'm the one championing this thing. Like, why are people saying that I'm not trying to pass these bills? Right. And I'm the one that's out there listening to this craziness coming at me. You know, and so mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it's really, you know, we press on. That's our job. We have no choice. <laughs> like, if you're of any worth, if you're worth your salt, you have to press on regardless of what comes at you because that's what we've been charged to do. But understanding that we also want to be able to make sure we're building bridges and that we're also not excluding ourselves from these circles so that people mm -hmm. are saying, I can't work with you. What you just did right. was foul. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. we don't have time for that either. <laughs> it's too urgent. I'm sorry. I've been thinking a lot about that the last couple of weeks. I know what you went through. Abby's been going through a lot. <clears throat> and, I, and I think about how we, you know, we all want to do and be and have that courage and be our better selves and do the exact right thing in the moment. Um, but I think we gotta have room for each other to not be so perfect all the time because when someone is in your face calling you a nigger, you're not always gonna react in the perfect way that you're supposed to. <laughs> you know, uh, so that, I just have been thinking about that a lot lately. Yes, we don't wanna do damage, but maybe we can hold a little space for each other and how we do things. And I appreciate that, because you're speaking to the humanity, and you're speaking to the humanity of the activist community, but there are actual people there in that building, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So right. I'm also a person. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. So I'm, when I'm you attack me, no, I'm including everybody. then it also diminishes oh, yeah. my ability to even accurately say what you want to say. If, right. if I'm speaking somehow on behalf of our community, I, right. want, to, I'm not, I'm I not, want to hold that truth. I'm not I want to hold that truth. the people who are uh, coming to present it. I'm saying every single person who's trying to do the right thing, mm -hmm. to hold a little room for them mm -hmm. to not be right. so perfect all the time. Yeah. 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 I just wonder as a legislator if you could offer us any specific strategies or ideas because I think when I'm coming more from the activist community mm -hmm. And like, what is the most effective way? So we have all these people that are angry about something, you know, like what is the most effective way to get that to you without attacking other legislators or, you know, we, we want to be strategic about it. I, w I want to be really clear that I'm not advocating for silencing voices. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, no, 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 you absolutely yeah. need to be on those front steps, do that do that all day, come sit on the floor. And it's really hard actually for activist politicians who are like, I usually am on the floor, this is like, right. you know, <laughs> I should be getting drug away myself. <laughs> it's a little strange to be sitting right here. It's, I don't know that there's a perfect strategy for it, but I do know that there are really excellent people in the building, excellent people in this room who do this work every day. And they can take that story and that pain and you can say, I need to tell my story and they can even maybe get you in front of the microphone. Mm -hmm to be in that committee room and tell your truth. And that's what they do all day. So I hope that helps. Yeah. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for your leadership and your role at the State House. It's just awesome work. For you. <laughs> Personifying political courage, really. I, um, I'm, I'm just appreciating how you framed this whole uh, talk and because for a while, I'm uh, just full disclosure. I'm one of those advocate lobbyists at the state house, and um, I often feel that um, I'm asking myself how to help legislators get that political courage. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you framed it in a way that says we all have to come together to give you that courage, to give you that support, to have your back. And. Um, one of the things that I think about is often being inside the state house, but being on a left issue, this is violence against women, um, I, I feel like I lean heavily upon the activists on the outside of the state house who are just rabble rousing, like out there, like screaming, um, because I'm sort of more in, in the system, if you will, inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so in that way, I really love how you frame this because you're talking about us 
all having different roles and appreciating one another, even though while we're on the same side of the issue, we may be upsetting each other's apple carts, you know, but really in the end, we're all on the same side of the issue. <laughs> and, um, and there's an advantage to having someone out there screaming about the thing that I'm sitting there negotiating <laughs> um, in order to have you be able to say, I got all those people and flip the paper and all those people and flip the paper, right? Mm -hmm. uh, all on, all together backing you up. And so I just feel like it's a really nice way of mm. pulling that whole picture together. And I feel really empowered right now. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Kaya. Thank you for your work. Thank, thank you. you for all of your great work. And time is up. <laughs> <laughs> One last comment. I saw you making that work. I, another, um, appreciation for you when um, I was being an activist around the racial justice work in the State House last year. Um, and there were several different streams of activists from different organizations um, bringing their um, amazing feedback into the process. Um, and as, as someone who was not involved in the, the bill making and the, that process, I was apart from it. Um, it could. It was confusing about which, um, what should I support? Mm. Um, and mm. I reached out to Kaya, and she was incredibly helpful. So mm. I would encourage you. And Kaya is not my representative, um, technically. I live in Addison County, not not. I don't live in Bennington. But she was still as a leader in that, um, the creation and passage of that bill, incredibly helpful. So thank you. I just want to say we're ending talking a lot about the legislature and what goes on in the state house, and I think as just a, a lot on my mind is where your story started, you know, as activists and advocates, and that there's a lot of ground that we leave behind in communities and in our towns mm -hmm. on the way to getting to the state house, and I think your story started with the gentleman who just said, I just had to be here because I saw a sign in my community. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I, don't, I, think, I feel like we give away how so much of our agency when we're only focused on the legislative mm -hmm. processes, and I just want to raise that up, that there's a lot of work to just like yeah, put it all together. Yeah. And that's where our common ground is. Yeah. Things get very polarized at the State House. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was in a coffee shop and a guy walked in who I would never think I would agree with politically and he's holding his three week old baby and talking about how we need universal public child care because mm. he suddenly has a three week old baby and he needs child care. <laughs> so our common ground is also on those. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. thank you very much, Ebony. Um, but before I start, I want to thank uh, some other people. Uh, I want to start off by thanking the original inhabitants of this land uh, that we are standing and sitting in today. And, allow, and for them allowing us to be invaders or intruders into this land. Some of us came voluntarily, others came by force, but I still want to honor that they are allowing us to be in this place, in this place at this time. Okay, turn it over. Okay. Uh, maybe I don't have this on right. Uh, Okay. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, what this invasion has meant. It has meant uh, an impact not only on the people, but the natural environment. So I also want to really, really uh, appreciate how the natural environment has withstood some of the things that we have subjected it to as a result of this invasion. Um, so I always like to start off that way. Uh, another group of uh, folks I want to thank and honor today are my ancestors. Um, without women like these women, I wouldn't be before you today. Um, I really, everything I do, I think about the sacrifice that they made in order for me to stand here before you, and I do not take that for granted one minute, not one day. Uh, these were some women who uh, marched to Washington post-Civil War uh, to talk about the conditions of being a person of African descent living in America. And I know, and as I've told my uh, 
little uh, nieces and nephews, I know that the blood that ran through them, that blood runs through me. So in doing that, I really feel that there's a sense of greatness. Even though I'm totally nervous standing in before you, I just like to have those women behind me because I know that they're behind me. off that way of honoring them and, and letting you know that uh, I'm a proud descendant of, of people who were enslaved Africans on this continent. But I'm very proud of that particular part of who I am. I have no shame about it. I will not, I refuse to take on the shame and the blame of the conditions under which I was subjected to and, and my people were subjected to. And oftentimes young uh, African American kids do feel that shame. And I think that one of the ways that I've been conceptualizing it for them is that when someone is abused, do we hold them accountable for their abuse? So the only way that I could help my little niece understand it when she was crying because of having to present on Frederick Douglass and the fear that because if she would say he was a slave, that that meant that she was a slave. So the only thing I can explain to her is if a kid is hit on the playground, whose fault is it that the kid was hit? She said, you know, my only eight-year-old could say, where's the other kid? The kid who did the hit. So I said, so who should have to apologize for that situation? Should it be the kid who was hit or the kid who did the hitting? And again, should it be the kid who did the hitting? So I said, should that kid be embarrassed for being hit? And she said, well, why would he be embarrassed? The other kid hit him, <laughs> okay? And so I said, well, that's the way I think about our experience. That's the way I think about it. And it's really easy when you are being abused to take responsibility for that abuse. Yeah. For those of you who work with the, in domestic violence, you know, probably know that better than I do. That, you, that those individuals internalize the abuse and then allow the abuser to once again reinforce why they should be abused. And that's how we have something called eugenics. Okay? And so all of us have bought into the narrative. And what I'm asking you to do is to break away from that narrative. That is not the type of narrative we need to have among educated people. And so that means hate them twelve. Okay? So the other thing I think is important is a lot of this is done not only with those who went before us, but those who are in front of us. For the children. This is from a film uh, called Children of the Camps, and it talks about the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II in the United States. And I just love this quote because this whole thing. For the sake of the children, we have to tell the stories. We have to keep telling those stories over and over again, because if not, we're prone to repeat those mistakes that we made. And this is not about blame. This is not about beating anybody up. This is about how do we stand in our truth? How do we recreate a narrative about who people say we are because we have a particular skin color? Any of us. And I always tell people we've all been snookered. We've all been snookered, we've all been lied to, and not only that, but we've all bought into the lies. And so I say it's time out for those lies. It's time for us to expose those lies for what they are. Because a lot of people didn't even know that there were such things as internment camps in the United States. I didn't find out, to be totally honest with you, I'm embarrassed to say, I didn't find out until I was in graduate school. And I was living in the state of Washington. And my major professor, his name is Jeffrey Mio, M-I-O, okay? And so he started weaving this story, because one day he had on this big coat. I said, Jeff, where are you going with that big coat, man? You know, because he's a little guy in a big old coat. And he said, this was the coat my grandfather wore when they took my family into the internment camp and he showed me all of these compartments where his grandfather had hid stuff in order for them to be able to trade for 
things that they needed. And it wasn't until then I started thinking, wow, I've been miseducated. Somebody didn't fill in all the blanks for me. Okay? And as I grew older and older in my time at grad school, because uh, I was there six years, I was on the extension plan. Um, <laughs> I was trying to get tenure. <laughs> but, um, as I stayed a little longer, I became closer and closer uh, to the Japanese American community. As a matter of fact, a lot of the women who supported me were these little old Japanese women who adopted me. And, and, and had it not been for them, there were days I was ready to quit. There were days I was like, I'm enough of this, I'm gonna go back home. I'd call my father crying and he would just say, baby, just stay there. I was like, dang, that's not the empathy that they're teaching me about here. But, but this whole idea that had it not been for that group of women who didn't even look like me, they supported me, they believed in me, they trusted that I had what it took to do what I needed to do. So I'm not standing here by myself, and it's not just those women like that, it's a lot of great women, including someone by the name of Elaine Zachariasen, Brenda Backrack, who is like 89 years old, and she's still somebody I consult with about what should I do, how should I do it? I don't know what to do, Mrs. Backrack. And she's like, let me tell you. <laughs> and she tells me what to do. So that's what we need to do for each other. We need to be at each other's beck and call. We should be willing and able to hang in there with each other. Think about the people you've had the worst fights with. Okay, I have uh, three other sisters. And I'm the youngest. Till this day, they try to tell me how to live my life. Till this day, they will say things like, if I'm gonna go on a trip, they'll call me and say, do you have money? <laughs> and I'm, so those times I say no, you know. <laughs> but this whole idea that some of the biggest fights I've had, I've had it with them over of a concept or over something. And yet I know it's done when we disagree. We do it in a loving way. We do it, and I know at their core they love me dearly. And that it's not about them trying to prove me wrong and me trying to prove them wrong. But it's out of this need to take care of, of me. Because I think, you know, I know they really care when they ask me, do you have money? Or when I drive home in the evening, my sister, I'm on the phone with her because she likes to talk to me. Talk me home, as she says. Because I work in Keene, but I live in Vermont. And so she talks me home because, and she'll say to me, well, when you get in the house, lock the door. And I'm like, am I 12? <laughs> and I know it's done out of care and out of love. And how can we convey that to one another, even when we're calling each other out. Even when I say to you, oh, this is a hard one, because we're really close. And let me tell you how what you just said had an impact on me. Mm -hmm. And for you to listen, what I'll say, you know I didn't mean that. Because that's, I know that's my first response. When I've done something and I'm feeling a little guilty about it, especially with students, the first thing I want to say, you know that's not what I meant. Or you know I'm cool, or whatever. <laughs> and in that moment, I wasn't cool. And so part of how do I understand if I really love and really care and really want to be close to you, that we have to have some degree of honesty between us. So I just love this quote because part of what we're doing is we're trying to do it for the children. The, the main question, the question I want you to consider is who would you be if the social construction of who you were told you are did not take root within you. Mm -hmm. Who would you be if you were really who you are? And that's a hard thing, given everything about us has been socially constructed. Every single thing. The society creates a narrative around what it means to be woman, what does it mean to be man, what does it mean and who you should love, how you should act as you age, okay? So it's all socially constructed, it's all kind of made up and then it takes root in us and we allow it to define us even though we know it's not us. 
Okay? And I'm always asking myself, why is it more important what other people think about me than what I think about myself? It's one of the most curious things, and it doesn't get better with age. <laughs> I thought by now I would outgrow it, like I outgrow those t-shirts from high school. <laughs> I always thought I would outgrow it, but there are times when I'm going on my journey, and someone says something, and I know it's not true. And yet I allow it to penetrate me so deeply, it gets me off of my game. And so I often ask this stuff, I'm not just asking this of you. I ask this of myself every single day. And the answer may be different each time. In the same way as when you we are a little kid, the people say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you would say something different every time. <laughs> every single time. I don't know, I think, I, I don't know, I just said I didn't, I didn't want to do anything. One time and my mother almost died because uh, I did it in front of a lot of people. And I said, I don't want to do anything. She was like, what the heck going wrong? So this whole idea of how do we ask this uh, of ourselves? How do we create a particular narrative that we define ourselves? So in a few minutes, uh, I'm going to have Audrey Lord help me out. Because I think that she, in her warrior port staff, Set the bar for all of us mm -hmm. in such a way that no matter what you do to help the cause, you are doing something to help the cause. Mm -hmm. OK? So let's go a little further. I just want to let you know some things that I've learned along the way, especially as it relates to doing this work, supporting other people and supporting uh, other situations that creates tensions and stress, okay? I learned the hard way that self-care is essential. I was reminded uh, like two weeks ago um, that that whole notion that survival is a form of resistance. It's a form of resistance. So if you can live as long as you need to live in order to do the work that you need to do, in order to have the impact on as many people as possible, that in itself is an act of resistance, especially in a world that lead you, would lead you to be, believe that you're not essential. And you say, just prove it, because I'm going to just keep on living. I'm going to be 102 years old. I know somebody that's 100 years old, and bless her heart, she's about this tall. And I tell you, if you ever want a sister, to back you up, call Francis Crow. Oh, yeah. You know Francis. Oh, yeah. yeah, that sister is, she, she's something to wreck. She's a force to wreck. I don't know, she might be 200 by now. <laughs> so Francis was protesting, and sometimes she'd be the only one on the corner. You know, I mean, so she is someone who has decided. I really think Francis has decided, I'm going to live as long as I can. And have an impact on as many young people as I possibly can. And then when I get considered as a young person, that means a lot to me. So she'll say, come help me. And, some, you know, and she'll even say things like, I know it's taken a long time to get to the car. Because she always wants to go somewhere. And I said, Francis, you can take how long you want to. Because she wants to do as much as she can with what she can in this particular time. So this whole idea you have to take care of yourself because it's, in order to be consistent and persistent, to be sustainable over time, you have to take care of yourself. And like I said, I learned the hard way. And so I also want you to learn the same way I did, this whole idea. So this whole idea of being able to survive, and not only survive, but to thrive, is a form of resistance. The next thing I said is keep your eyes on the prize. And uh, this friend of mine, Packy, Packy Willen, always talks about weapons of mass distraction. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You go out on your game, and somebody distracts you, and you go behind the shiny object, or the squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> and there you are, not participating in the way that you need to participate with the work that you started on. OK? No, I'm not saying the person intentionally did it or the group intentionally did it, but I'm just saying that there are times when these things happen. And if you're not 
having that type of resistance, maybe you're not doing as much as you think you're doing. Because that happens. You'll be on your game and you'll be working. So know that there's a possibility that everybody will be encouraged by the work that you do. And that's okay. If you have your eyes on the prize and you keep going towards your goal, then that's a different kind of situation that you find yourself in when people are saying you're going the wrong way or why are you like that, all these things that people can say to keep you off of your game. So if some people within your families are saying to you, why do you want to work on this racism stuff? It doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> all you do is you say, okay, and you just keep going. <laughs> okay? So because that is what's important, that we have to keep on. We have to be in this mode that nothing will turn us back. In the same way that those women, I don't think that they were able to hop a plane or get into some fancy car. I bet a lot of them walked to D.C. Okay? And if they can walk to D.C., I could sure get my fat butt in my car and drive somewhere. Okay? And, and I do know I'm fat. So I have no issues with that. I have no issues with that. I know. Because she's kind of looking at me like, girl, you say that out loud? <laughs> so what you want to do is make sure, make sure that those weapons of mass distraction, as you try to do the work, as we try to form coalitions, that you don't allow to be taken off your game, looking at the squirrel, the shiny object. Because those things will come up, and you will feel discouraged. The third thing I learned is uh, that it's really important for us to use every gift, talent, skill in this room collectively. There are some people who are probably won't be the people out front talking, and that's good to have people who are willing to serve as people who will serve as the force pushing. Okay? Because some people are better at, at pushing than they are of being up front. So every skill, every talent, every gift, you can't turn it away. It's very helpful to have multiple. That's the beauty of diversity, that not everyone comes to the table with the same thing. Because if that's the case, you're missing something. You're missing something if you don't let multiple voices be heard. And as a matter of fact, I always say, and that's why I always like to thank nature, nature gets it. They get, nature gets diversity. Nature doesn't even have to think about it. Nature gets how critical it is to have diversity. When you see the power of the season coming up, and all of those people coming from all over the world to close up the roads, they're looking for some diversity. They're not going somewhere where you're just going to see just the same color. Hey, you crave it. But yet, as humans, we resist it. So this whole idea of how do we do this with each other by knowing that I can't knit a stitch. Is that what you call it, a stitch? Okay. I can't knit a stitch. But when you remember when, and then, and, and, you know, when they were making those pussy hats, you needed some sisters who could knit. And there were some sisters knitting right at the, the, the thing. Here, girl, come on. I think the one that I had on the wall of my skin knitting. It was to have women out there who were in front talking, that there were women who were handling the logistics, and that the women who gathered to knit a very important symbolic piece played a critical role at those marches. Again, if we would have said, oh, we don't need no knit, knitting, and we would say it just like that in Louisiana, we don't need no knitting. <laughs> If we would have just said that, the knitters and their gift would have been used. And then when you saw that beautiful array of those pink hats, you're like, wow, the knitters pulled us all together. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is that we're all a work in progress, and you're never done. I hate to disappoint you, but you are never done. You're always evolving and becoming. And I think that part of the reason that we're so shocked when someone gives us feedback is because we think we're done. <laughs> I never say I'm an authority on anything. I'm just not an authority. I'm not even an authority on my own life. Because I'm surprised at some of the things I do sometimes. 
I'm like, I can't believe I just did that. I said that. Okay? So for me to assume that I can't be critiqued or that I can't receive feedback, even from a little kid, Sometimes I listen to it. My niece told me only geeks take pictures with their iPad. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, why? why? I, I said, why? She said, just is. And I said, well, <laughs> so I said, help me understand, why would they put a camera on the iPad? <laughs> and my sister was just shaking her head. I was like, why is she arguing with this child? And I was in an argument, and we were having a discussion. <laughs> and so then she said something to me, and I said, oh, I learned something new today. And I did look around and nobody was using their iPad. They were using their phones or real cameras. And I thought, well, maybe she's right. You know? And I asked my students, I said, I'm and they were like, mm. <laughs> So again, we're all a work in progress. And especially when it comes to technology, I'm definitely that. But we're always becoming. And how do we together help each other become? How do we complement each other in such a way that we're all becoming? And there's no really end. It's an ongoing process. A uh, walk you talk. Um, Audre Lorde talked about transforming silence into language and language into action. So how do we take, did I do that right? OK. So people are kind of looking like that. I'm always looking at, you know, the, at people's reactions. Uh, in order to know if I'm going down the wrong path. Um, but oftentimes we know things, but we don't take it the next step. Or we're not willing to be vocal about what we don't know. You know, have you ever been in a situation where you didn't know what was going on, and you just kept quiet, and you're like, I'm not saying anything. And then you realize, I have no idea what's just going on. And I always tell people, why is it so hard to say, you know, look, I have no idea what's going on. And it's easy when you're working with young people, because I'm constantly, they, they say words, I have no idea what they're, I, you know, I like, I see the words forming, and I see your lips moving, so I know you're saying something, but I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> so it's really taught me how important it is, if I don't know something, not to remain silent. And then most of all, <laughs> once I do know something, I really can't remain silent. Because what I'm supposed to do with this newfound understanding or knowledge is to turn it into some type of language to be able to communicate with other people. And then I have to take the next step. Now that I know, now I have to transform it into some type of action. Okay? And again, it doesn't have to be a major action. It has to be some type of action to connect with the new knowledge. So if someone gives me feedback that I was just ageist, for me to not change my behavior based on the feedback that I had just been ages, okay? And for not to have an impact on my behavior, even if I don't think that they're, quote, justified for telling me. Because you know how sometimes, I'm going to pretend to hit you, but I won't really hit you. So, <laughs> but I like to let people know, because you might start screaming or something. <laughs> And suppose I hit you, what's you going to say? Ow. And I'm going to say, that didn't hurt. <laughs> but we do that often. Mm -hmm. Someone will say, let me just tell you what you said and how it had an effect on me. They said, and you go, that, that didn't really hurt, did it? Or we compare it to something that's worse. Mm -hmm. Where at least we're not polo wearing, khaki wearing, tiki car tor torch carrying folks. We're not them. We're not them. And so how do we allow ourselves to take in this feedback and to walk our talk? And I think that that's why sometimes we don't want to know something. Because as uh, Shelby, I think what Shelby Still said, we'd like to claim our ignorance as innocence. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't know. <laughs> but once someone has taken the silence transformed it into language, it speaks to us to take an action. And for me to determine that that's not an action that's necessary, that's why we have to listen to the person who's being punched. Even if I didn't mean to hurt you, 
So there are times that I know that I've said things, done things, engaged in it, and I, I, from the depths of my heart, I didn't mean it. And at the same time, I have to figure out how to repair that harm that I've just caused, even though I didn't mean it. So to tell somebody that they're hypersensitive, they're overreacting, that's my favorite, overreacting. And then I always like, what is the proper level of reaction in this particular moment? Please tell me so I don't know how to react. <laughs> because I'm only reacting based on my experience and my interaction in that moment. So it's not an overreaction, it's a reaction. <laughs> It may not be the reaction that you would give, because that's what we're usually basing it on, how we would respond in that situation, rather than allowing there's a different normal based on the different things that people experience. That's why I'm not a psychologist to the degree I was anymore. Because it was starting to get hard and hard for me to really engage in, especially individual therapy, without understanding the impact of the larger cultural context. And I kept saying to people, this culture can make you crazy. And I don't take that lightly. So then I said, well, now I need to do something, now that I know this information, that will have an impact on the cause rather than the outcome of it. And then to further pathologize people for reacting in a way, like post-traumatic stress. I get confused about this. And I know that there, there is such a thing as post-traumatic stress. People have stress. You know, my family just waded the water up to their chest. Now, I know they're going to have some stress. But how is it for me to say that they're responding in a way that's above and beyond how they should respond? I don't know about you, but if I wade through test high water with all kind of crap in it, including snakes, <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, if you start telling me I'm abnormal, I'm going to say, let me go dunk you in some water. <laughs> so I think that part of what we have to do is not just use our experiences to define other people's realities. We have to figure that out. The next thing is we need to have an examination of not only self, but also the system. Okay, so it's real easy to make this about one-on-one -on -one relationships. But it's a system, as I said earlier, that this system has snookered all of us into believing certain narratives to be true that comes between the two of us having a real relationship. Our socioeconomic class, that there are certain places where people of different class, they won't even talk to each other. And it's because we have this system, especially in the United States, because of capitalism, that we have to keep those two groups from talking to each other. Now, that's not if you're in the, because if you're in the one percent, you don't want the other 99 percent to get together. Because even you, you can do math, right? <laughs> if 90, and if we just do simple math, if you have 100 people, and if 99 people team up and piss off at one person, so what you have to do is you have to co-op some of those people into believing they just like you. And that's what has happened in this country time and time again. All we have to do is look at what happened when poor white people start teaming up with slaves and former slaves. They were like, oh, heck no. Or as they say, heck to the no. We cannot allow this to happen. So a real clear system was put in place to make poor white folks feel like they were better than those former slaves and those black folks. Regardless of what your degree is, regardless of how much you have as a black person, as a white person, I'm far more superior. And that system was created in reaction to people of conscious sin. They're messing over both of us. I was about to say something else. They're messing over both of us. They're messing with both of us. Let's team together. So again, if we go back to the point number two, not everybody will be happy that you're coming together because now you're going to confront a system, okay? And then you're going to corrupt the youth. Ask Socrates what happened when he told the youth to question authority. That's right. He had to drink hemlock. I don't know about you, but I don't want to drink any hemlock. That sounds like a painful death. Okay, so this whole idea of what do we do when that those type of forces come
come together. When we start to do a real critical analysis, silence, language, do the analysis, now you move to action. So you have to realize that not everyone will be happy about that. This is another one I think, and I'm almost done. This whole idea is this work is not about me, or not about any one of us individual. It's about all of us. And I really like that quote. I don't know if you saw the Beast of the Southern Wild. And the little hush puppy was the little main character in it. She was uh, five years old when they made the movie. And you remember she was nominated for an Oscar. I think she was the youngest child to ever, person to be ever nominated. And I like that line when she says, I see that I'm a little piece of a big, big universe. And that makes things right. So if we can really harness all of the energy of these little pieces and we pull them together, just think about how powerful we will be once we look at ourselves, once we understand that the system is having an impact on us being together, and then we say, we're not going to be separate anymore. We're not going to allow that to separate us anymore. We're not going to allow that to serve as one of those shiny objects that we will turn our heads to. And the last, oh, I have one more. The last, another one is discover yourself, know yourself, defy yourself, be yourself, and encourage other women to do the same. And I really, really like, again, I, I, I didn't realize how much I was quoting Audre Lorde until I was reading over the notes early and went, oh, I, I feel her presence. Um, and, and, you know, so when you call upon what you need, the universe will answer. And so today it was answered by Audrey. Um, but this whole idea of this, I have to define myself. If not, I'd be eaten up and consumed by other people's beliefs of who I am. So I have to define myself. And when I tell you who I am, that's who I am. So when people, I always, uh, Sometimes people will say to me, because um, I sent out uh, earlier this week the idea that I want to remind people on campus, especially faculty, uh, when you are addressing students, don't assume you know their gender. Okay? Don't assume it. And most of all, don't ask them, are you a woman or a man? Like this? Yeah. I said because uh, I didn't say it in the email, but I said I will let you down. But I didn't say it in the email. But I think I said something equivalent to that, but in a nice way. In a nice way. Because <laughs> I know how to be nice. Um, and so I was asking people uh, to remember to that in the because this thing is possessed. Uh, oh, I think it went down. <laughs> my breast to talk. <laughs> uh, so one faculty member uh, wrote me and said, uh, do I have to uh, use the name that they want to be called? And I said, uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, so I proceeded to give him an analogy. I said, you remember this movie called Roots and the book called Roots? And the person kept saying, my name is Kunta Kinte. And they say, no, your name is Toby. And he comes in, my name is Kunta Kinte. No, your name is Toby. Whack. Oh, yeah. So he was beaten into submission to being the person that they wanted him to be. And when I was done, they were like, wow. And I said, yeah. So when you don't honor what people lead with their name, if you can't honor that, I'm worried about if you can honor anything about that person. So it's very critical for you to use the name as we have agreed upon. Maybe you weren't at the meeting, and even if you were not, it's there. You honor that person's name because that's a part, an integral part of who they are. And for you not to do it would be equivalent to hitting them over the head with something that doesn't represent them. And the last thing is the personal is the political. And of course, I had to call up Sister Angela. Mm -hmm. The whole idea, she says, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. Mm -hmm. So I hope that's where we are in this room. 
that we're coming from that particular stand, that we are now going to take an action together, collectively, to address those things we can no longer accept. And we're doing it for the children, and we're doing it for our ancestors. And most of all, we're doing it for ourselves. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here at this uh, Sisters Keeper. Um, I work with a program called Reading to End Racism. Some of you may be familiar. It's been in our public schools here in Vermont since 2002. So, you know, we have been having a conversation with race in the classroom. I think that's a good launch point because our young people, we keep talking about the future. Our children also teach us. And it provides quite an opportunity for children to actually come home, to these, come home and have these discussions in their families and actually be in a leadership position because they're not always welcome with the conversation. You know, I've been to a couple of the workshops this morning and um, I kind of feel like I'm going to reiterate some of the things that um, were mentioned, particularly from Dr. Morris, and that is our, per our political is our personal. I walk that road. I can't walk any other way. Because if I take my personal from my political or vice versa, I'm not a whole human being. All of us walk our politics. And being an educator, they always tell us keep it out of the classroom. That's hard. Because then you're not a full person in the classroom as well. Not to say that we force opinions on students, but we have to talk about this issue called racism. I've been in a lot of trouble for talking about racism. I'm serious. I've been gone for two years because I had to take care of myself. This thing called racism almost killed me. Seriously. And now I'm on the other side of recovery. Just imagine working with educators, bringing a program called Reading to End Racism into the classroom. You prepare these teachers. You actually train them. You know, it's like to walk in a classroom and a teacher tell you, we're not going to talk about race. My response usually is, did you miss the training? <laughs> really? Because that's why we're here. Why do you think we're called Reading to End Racism? <laughs> Secondly, I got a big problem with colorblindness is destroyed a lot of relationships, a lot of friendships. I actually had a principal a few years ask me, Denise, how am I going to get my students across race to hang out with each other? How do we do that? And I looked at this educator, and I said, well, you've got to start with yourself. Because one, you're a model, a role model. And if you cannot model having authentic relationships with other adults across difference, especially race, you certainly cannot model it to your students. My prescription? Go home and find some black folks and become friends with them. I'm serious. Become real friends. So this thing called colorblindness is really disturbing me. It keeps me up at night. Because that's why we're in trouble. And it's been in the way for us to really have these discussions. That whole construct called color blindness. I just want to add, and we'll keep it short and then I'll open it to questions, but I want you to think about this. I'm sure there's not one person in this room that wasn't told that you don't see race. That's how. People raise their children, particularly white people. Not to say that people of color don't do it, but I've run into a lot of white folks that say, we don't see race. I don't see your color. And then I just have to either have a, a conversation where they'll actually take in the information and do some adjusting, or I have to cut the relationship off because they're basically saying what? I don't see you. Mm, that's a big insult. I think it's worse than forgetting a person's name. So I just want to 
bring this home. Stop with the colorblindness business already. Seriously, when in your, you're in your spheres of influence and that drops on the table, correct people. Please correct them. And I think that's it. That's my spiel for today. <laughs> Forget the colorblindness. We know it doesn't work. Okay. When you tell a young person they're not seeing what they're seeing, do you know we as adults actually gaslight our children by saying that? Think about it. We're gaslighting them. So then they can't believe anything, or they are always second doubt or question themselves. So stop saying we don't see color. Because let me tell you, when I walk up on people, I see your color. I'm serious. I might not ask you what your identity is. I open it for you, but I see white people. It sounds like I also see dead people. <laughs> I see white people. I'm just going to tell you that. Any questions? Another construct. Yeah. It's also to like excuse the oppression of people of color. By saying like I don't see you, I don't see color, by saying I don't acknowledge your pain, your trauma, and how I have terrorized you as like as a people, as a group of people. Because race was created to divide and to conquer. Okay, there was a reason why race was created. And it was to see color and to divide based on that and to create a hierarchy based off of that. So you saying that it's just So we have to see each other in all of our fullness. I, I go into classrooms and I talk with young people all the way up. And the first thing when I open up with reading to read and racism, I say to them, when you see my skin color, what does it tell you? It tells you only three things about me. In reality, it tells you where my ancestors come from, potentially. It's a marker of their geography, and it also means how close I live to the sun and those ancestors. That's all it tells you. It doesn't tell you anything about my intellect. It doesn't tell you anything about my personality. It doesn't tell you whether I like chocolate or vanilla ice cream. It just tells you those three things. So in my work in racism and anti-racism and having these discussions, is we're launching that discussion with children from the lens of biology. And then we start bringing in the social aspects and breaking down racism. But let's face it, I'm in a room of a variety of people, but I'm seeing your differences. And I'm also seeing your skin color. I married a white guy. He told me he didn't see my skin color. Didn't last too long. <laughs> just saying. Just saying. Because I certainly saw him. But he's going to tell me he didn't see this. Who are we fooling? So let's stop gaslighting our children and each other. It's the worst thing we could do. <laughs> <laughs>